today we'll talk about varicella zoster virus varicella zoster virus is a double stranded dna virus and uh, causes two clinically distinct forms of the disease that is it causes varicella that is chicken pox and herpes zoster herpes zoster is also called as shingles so varicella zoster virus is a double stranded dna virus causing two important diseases clinically okay Firstly, the varicella zoster virus. It is a double stranded DNA virus, causes two clinically important diseases that is varicella and uh, herpes zoster. The primary infection of varicella includes viremia and uh, widespread cellular vascular eruption, after which virus persists in the secondary, in the sensory nerve ganglion cells and produces herpes zoster on reactivation. So basically, the primary infection of the varicella will include the viremia and the widespread vesicular eruption is seen, after which the virus will persist in the sensory nerve ganglion and if the virus is reactivated, it produces herpes zoster. Firstly, we'll talk about varicella, which is otherwise commonly called as chickenpox. Epidemiology of this, it affects younger age and temperate regions compared to the tropics. Late winters and early summers is when this is the seasonal variation of the varicella. It is seen in the late winters and the early summer uh, uh, seasons and 90 to 95 percent of cases occur before 20 years of age and only two percent are seen in the elderly or the adults in 1995 there was an important uh, milestone here wherein varicella vaccine was identified it was manufactured and um, that changed the epidemiology of the disease as a whole 96 percent of children have infection one month after exposure to the index case supposing there's an index case at home and one month later the children 96 percent of them develop infection Incubation period is 14 to 16 days, around 10 to 21 days is the average incubation period. And the spread here is very important. It spreads by respiratory droplets as well as by direct contact also. Airborne spread also is seen here. Okay, and the disease is infectious two days before the onset of rash to five, six days after the onset of rash also. It is important until the lesions crust. Uh, until the lesions crust, it will be infectious only. Okay, so vesicle fluid also will contain large amounts of the virus and complete dry crusts are non-infectious. So the crusting will make it non-infectious. Until then, they will be infectious only. Okay, adults will have more severe disease. If the disease is seen, if virus is seen in children, it's more of less severity and it is okay. But in adults, it is of higher morbidity and mortality immunity is lifelong after infection secondary attacks are uncommon and uh, mostly un immunocompetent patients it is uncommon whereas in immunocompromised we can see secondary attacks being there it's a live attenuated vaccine and the modified and mild virus because of the vaccine also can be seen in hiv infected patients so we see that there is typical wide widespread atypical virus and disseminated pox like lesions can be seen pathogenesis of this virus it is a double standard dna virus encoding around 75 proteins it has a lipid envelope after entry through the mucosa of the upper respiratory tract or pharynx it will enter there and this virus will undergo a localized replication in the regional lymph nodes Dissemination through blood and lymphatics happens and the reticular endothelial system now it will try to clear the virus. All of these changes are occurring during the incubation period that is during the early 10 to 21 days uh, all of these changes are occurring. Okay. After this there is a second phase of viremia which occurs 9 days after infection and persists throughout the development of skin lesions. Cell mediated immunity develops during the course of the virus and it will persist for many years and protects from severe infection. So again cell mediated immunity for us is important. In the skin, we find that there is ballooning degeneration of the prickle cell layer. Ballooning degeneration of the prickle cell layer with the eosinophilic inclusions and marginated chromatin and nuclear can be seen. Multinucleated giant cells are important here. These multinucleated giant cells up to 15 in number may be seen. Intracellular edema, it will form the vesicle. Upper dermis shows inflammatory cells. Clinical features, it's a self-limited disease. We have to assure the patient that it's a self-limited disease. Fever, mildly generalized, sporadic rash may be present. Older children, they will suffer with fever, sore throat, mildly, anorexia, severe backache can be present. Rash, usually here, the rash starts on the face here. Okay, So face on, on, the, on the scalp, then it will spread cordially to involve the extremities involving the proximal parts as well. So on the face it will start, then it will spread cordially. New lesions occur in crops and fever will persist as new lesions occur. Pruritus also can be seen. So most of them forget pruritus but pruritus also is seen here. This varicella, it will begin as a macule then it will rapidly become papule followed by vesicles on an irregular erythematous base and this characteristically is called dewdrops and rose petal appearance. So this is a macule followed by a papule followed by a vesicle on an erythematous base. 
Mesicles enlarge and become umbilicated or pustules and crust in 2 to 4 days. So, in 2 to 4 days, they become non infective because they form crusts here. Lesions of different stages are seen in the same area at the same time. So, all of these macule, papule, pustule can be seen in different areas in the same individual. In adults, as I told you before, it's very severe and it can cause varicella and pneumonia in adults, which is a very severe complication. Secondary uh, bacterial infection also may be seen in adults. Vesicles may be hemorrhagic or they may rupture also. The number of vesicles normally would be 300 to 300 is the normal number. There is more than 500 vesicles are seen. If there is severe infection, there is more than 500 vesicles seen. New vesicles will stop within 4 days and they will crust about 2 to 4 days. Crusts fall in 1 to 2 weeks and they leave a temporary hypopigmentation. Scarring is very rarely seen. Vesicles on the mucous membranes also can be seen. Palate, nose, pharynx, larynx, conjunctiva can be seen and they rupture to form shallow ulcers on the mucous membrane. Secondary cases are more severe than the primary cases. Adults are more severe. Complications could be pneumonia, encephalitis and death. Finally, this hemorrhagic vesicle, sometimes only fluid filled vesicles will be seen. Sometimes hemorrhagic vesicles are seen. These hemorrhagic vesicles are very extensive and they are associated with high fever constitutional symptoms and these are mostly seen in immunocompromised patients and patients who are malnourished so in malnourished patients you can see these uh, hemorrhagic vesicles next coming to the immunocompromised patients severe disease and more complications are seen lesions will persist for longer time and new lesions continue to appear for more than a month widespread dissemination systemic involvement life-threatening secondary infections also can be seen so these are the characteristic lesions dew drops on rose petal impact of vaccine because of vaccine we've seen breakthrough varicella occurring it's, it's seen in 20 percent of those people who are vaccinated it's also called as mild varicella like syndrome it presents with uh, it's a milder disease less than 60 lesions normally will be 200 to 300 lesions seen now huh? here only 60 lesions will be seen and no fever less complications also but they can transmit the disease to others they are infected now coming to the effect of varicella during pregnancy if the mother gets varicella during pregnancy, the disease severity is more in pregnancy. The patient will have varicella pneumonia, rapidly progresses to hypoxia, respiratory failure can lead to mortality also. The fetus of the baby congenital varicella syndrome may occur if the mother is having varicella during the first and second trimester. So during the first and second trimester, if the mother has varicella, it can cause congenital varicella syndrome. Neonates born to mothers who have clinical disease within five days before and two days after delivery. They are at greatest risk of development of disseminated varicella and death. And severe varicella during pregnancy can result in zoster in urine. If the mother has severe varicella during pregnancy, it can directly cause zoster in the infant. Complications of varicella, it causes secondary bacterial infections, neurologic complications like encephalitis, Reyes syndrome, focal deficits, transverse myelitis, pulmonary like pneumonia, GIT like hepatitis, vascular like thrombocytopenic purpura, purpura fulminans, disseminated intravascular coagulation, musculoskeletal like labdomyolysis and arthritis, eye like acute retinal necrosis syndrome, others like erythema multiforme and Steven Johnson syndrome. So this erythema multiforme and Steven Johnson syndrome need to be kept in mind. Diagnosis is by mostly looking at the lesion, so clinically it is diagnosed. Giant smear can be done, which was multinucleated giant cells. In all of these lesions, it is for multinucleated giant cells and eosinophilic inclusion bodies. Skin biopsy will show ballooning degeneration and multinucleated giant cells and nuclear inclusions again. RT PCR, viral culture, uh, direct course and antibody test, ADs and pharma also can be done for diagnosis of the varicella. Treatment is a benign disease and does not require any treatment. Symptomatic treatment is sufficient and antivirals can be given for infants, older children, immunocompromised patients. Antihistaminics for if the patient has pruritus, then antihistaminics can be given. Fingernails need to be cropped because to avoid spread of the disease. And then acetaminophen, aspirin should not be given because of the risk of developing race syndrome. If there is secondary bacterial infection, antibiotics can be given. So these are the indications of oral acyclovir. When to give oral acyclovir uh, to the patient? It can be given in older children who are older than 12 years of age. Secondary household contacts if they are present. And if there is any history of chronic cutaneous or cardiopulmonary disorders. And in children who take um, intermittent oral or inhaled uh, steroid therapy and children who take chronic salicylates. So in these particular patients, they can give oral acyclovir. Otherwise, um, just symptomatic treatment uh, in others is sufficient. Only symptomatic treatment is sufficient in others. Antivirals, we have acyclovir and uh, this is in healthy and immunocompromised patients. Adults also it can be given to prevent complications. Preferably within the first one to two days only it is started. Otherwise, it is so preferably within three days it needs to be started otherwise no use immunosuppressed patients 
16 per minute. Otherwise, oral can be given. Oral is 20 mg per kg. That is 800 mg. A cycle over is given. That is five times in a day we give. Five times per day we give, and that can be given for five to seven days. We say it can be given. So that is the oral formulation. In no compromise, we will give 10 mg per kg, eight hourly for um, seven days. A cycle over can be. Given in pregnancy, but it's not studied yet. Prevention of varicella is by giving varicella vaccine. The regimen for children less than 12 years is the first dose is given between 12 to 15 months, and second dose at 4 to 6 years of age. And in children more than 13 years of age, um, two doses of varicella is given at 4 to 8 weeks apart. Contraindications women who are pregnant should not give immunocompromised patients, hematologic malignancies, family history of hereditary immunodeficiency, those who are exposed to varicella or zoster in previous 21 days, transfusion immunoglobulin. Should not be given. Administration of salicylic cyanide therapy should not be given. Then coming to the post-exposure prophylaxis, um, varicella, uh, varicella zoster virus immunoglobulin can be given. That is given within nine to six hours of exposure. It is given. Patients who have taken oral steroids for at least fourteen days within the last three months, and non-immune pregnant women who have been exposed to varicella infection, we can give them. That was about varicella. Now we'll go to herpes zoster, otherwise called as shingles. Herpes zoster is a localized disease characterized by unilateral radicular pain, vesicular eruption, and limited to a dermatome innervated by a single spinal or cranial sensory nerve ganglion. Zoster means girdle and segmental distribution it means. And uh, it is caused by reactivation. It is caused by the reactivation of the same virus. It is the same virus which causes both the disease. So, virus is zoster virus. On reactivation, it will cause herpes zoster. Okay? It will be lying dormant in the sensory ganglion after causing virus alarm. So, once it is activated, it will cause herpes zoster the second time. Epidemiology it increases with age more after 50 years. Women and black races are more commonly affected. Risk factors for developing herpes zoster advancing age, malignancy, cell mediated immunity if it is reduced, and uh, chronic lung and kidney diseases. Immunocompromised patients such as transplant, receiving immunos modulators, HIV infected patients are those are the risk factors. So these viruses are zoster virus from the skin lesions, they pass to the mucosa and then they pass to the endings of the sensory nerves and they're transported to sensory ganglia where they remain latent. Clinical features are seen in reactivation. Reactivation is caused by immunosuppression or by trauma, stress, sunburn, tumor, surgery, irradiation of spine, sinusitis, old age. All of these can trigger the varicella virus. When the immunity falls below critical levels, virus multiplies in the ganglion and causes neuronal necrosis, inflammation leading to severe neuralgia. It will spread down the sensory nerve and gets released into the skin causing the vesicular dermatomes rash. Local palsies may be seen, transverse myelitis and meningoencephalitis also may be seen. Clinical features, it presents with acute neuritis and rash. Prodromal symptoms are present like headache, fever, malice, fatigue. Pain is the most common symptom. Most of the patients will have pre-eruptive pain mostly. Pain is a constant intermittent uh, this thing and it will present 3 to 4 days prior only. It will present with pain. Deep burning, throbbing, stabbing sensation will be present and pain happens sometimes only when touched. And pruritus may be present. Pain mimics pleurisy, angina, appendicitis, duodenal ulcer, cholecystitis, renal colic. So they will mimic those conditions and that has to be differentiated and carefully looked into. There's something called a zoster sign herpete. Only lesions are not seen. But the uh, characteristic, uh, uh, the, le the, the lesions um, have segmental pain only will be there without developing any lesions. Okay, There's only pain and no lesions here. Rash begins. 3 to 4 days after pain and it is unilateral. Unilateral is important here. And erythematous papules evolve into grouped vesicles. Again, this grouped vesicles is important. Or bullae and into pustules. Mucous membrane also may be affected. Lymph nodes are enlarged and tender. They will crust by 7 to 10 days. You see that they will form crusts. Development of new lesions after a week if it arises. Then you have to think about some immunodeficiency. In uncomplicated cases, it results in 2 to 3 weeks. They can be scarring hypohyperpigmentation, generally limited to one dermatome in immunocompetent patients. Most commonly, thoracic dermatome is affected, otherwise, cervical, trigeminal, ophthalmic, lumbosacral can be other dermatomes. In immunocompromise, if the patient is immunocompromised, then multiple dermatomes, hyperkeratotic, ectomatic lesions are seen. They are most severe. So, this is a typical appearance. Segmental distribution, thoracic involvement, grouped by cycles of bullying and erythematous base. Again, here it is involving the dermatomal distribution unilateral. Designated zoster. Here, multiple dermatomes are involved. Lesions may become quite severe with unusual manifestations like they are hemorrhagic, hyperkeratotic, ectomatic, and scarring will be present. Disseminated zoster is seen here. Visceral to lungs, liver, and brain are seen. Multiple recurrences can be seen. 
these are the necrotic ulcerative lesions unusually seen in immunocompromised patients complications it presents with uh, post operatic neuralgia which is the most common complication others like ocular complications ram say hand syndrome bacterial infection meningoencephalitis motor paralysis pneumonitis hepatitis can be seen diagnosis is mainly clinical zang smear which was multinucleated giant cells direct fluorescent and the viral culture topical therapy is with cold compressors calamin lotion systemic therapy is cyclovir 800 mg is cyclovir for 5 times otherwise val cyclovir 1 gram tid into 5 days role of steroids effective in ramsey hand syndrome only otherwise it's not effective helpful along with antivirals and varicella zoster induced cranial nerve palsies where compression of the affected nerve can contribute to disability treatment of post operatic neuralgia we give topical capsaicin analgesic anti inflammatory amitriptyline in 25 to 75 mg carbamazepine phenytoin and amitriptyline carbapentin pregabalin valproic acid intrathecal methylprednisone and lastly most commonly we give amitriptyline Zoster vaccine has been introduced. It's a live attenuated vaccine. One time subcutaneous injection is given. More than sixty years old. It reduces the incidence of herpes zoster. Duration were uh, of pain and, uh, were reduced in those who developed zoster and reduced incidence of post-operative neuralgia. It's not given as a treatment for herpes zoster or post-operative neuralgia. In pregnancy, less complications. It is rarely passed to fetus and oral acyclovir can be given in pregnant women with herpes zoster.